on many of the things on the cyber week or office. Um, I want to start by saying that the, the title of this um, panel is a little bit um, misleading. Uh, we are going to talk about NIST compliant, but it's primarily going to be focused on um, cybersecurity and the DFARS law, law, the new DFARS regulation on cyber, and also NIST compliance, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, and if you need any more information on this, um, on the small business websites, um, there's a cybersecurity page. If you have a business let us go. Um, you'll find a lot more information on the cybersecurity and DFARS rule. And my phone number is um, at the bottom of it if you have any, any questions. So I answer questions all the time from businesses about the, about the new DFARS rule. Um, so I'm very happy to see you all here today. Um, I want to thank our panel members. I think we've got a great panel today. We've got people from OSD as well as uh, the Navy and the Marines. And um, when I was reading their bios, um, I realized that we have someone from all the services. Um, we've got um, Navy and Marines, and Mickey uh, was involved in the Air Force, was a former Air Force officer, and Mary was um, used to work for the Army. So we've got all the services represented here. Um, so, how I'm going to do things is I'm going to introduce the panel members and then I'm going to ask each one of the panel members a question and then I'll open up to the floor for questions. And if I don't get any answers, any questions from the floor, I'll keep on asking my own questions. So, if you don't want to hear my questions, please uh, start thinking of some questions to ask. Um, so, our first panelist is uh, Ms. Vicky Machetti. Um, he is the Director of the Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Program within the DOD Chief Information Office. Um, prior to um, working with the DOD, she was in private industry, and prior to that, she was an um, a, um, officer in the U.S. Air Force. Um, she was the commander of the 25th Weather Squadron at um, Davis Mountain Air Force Base. Um, our second panelist is um, Mr. Um, Kenneth Bible. Um, Mr. Bible um, is currently a, a deputy director of the Command and Control Communications Computers Department at Headquarters Marine Corps. Um, he also serves as the deputy chief information officer for the Marine Corps, um, where he formulates broad policy guidance covering the information technology, cybersecurity, and communication infrastructure in support of the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, Mr. Bible has um, 30 years of Civil service experience um, working with the Marines and Spot War. Um, our next panelist is um, Ms. Mary Thomas. Um, Mary Thomas currently works in the OST um, Director of Defense Procurement Acquisition Policy. Um, that's where they make all the regulations for how industry can procure, um, how the DOD can procure, procure weapon systems from industry. Um, within DCAP, um, Ms. Thomas is responsible for representing DCAP and the DOD contracting community in all matters related to cybersecurity. Um, our next um, last panelist is Ms. Teresa Lang. Um, she is a Deputy Director of Department of the Navy, Deputy Chief Information Officer, and a Senior Information Security Officer. Um, of course, she manages analytical, technical, and subsequent efforts driving continuing cybersecurity improvements across the Navy. Um, before um, joining the Navy, she was um, she had extensive industry experience. Um, um, where she, she worked at um, Dell, where she was the Dell Corporate Security Strategist and Technical Director of Business Assurance and Strategic Initiatives. Uh, she also um, was responsible for Dell's supply chain integrity process and worked with U.S. Cyber Consequences Units to develop the supply chain integrity and security guide. Um, so we got a lot of great experience from government, industry, um, across the DOD. Um, so my first question uh, goes to Vicki. Um, so for the, uh, just before I, before I get the question, so for those of you unfamiliar, that there's a new cyber DFARS uh, regulation that requires um, all industry to, um, to um, by a certain by the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, which is NIST 800-1.7, um, 
1971. Um, so it has created a framework for the for the government on how we should deal with cybersecurity. So all all DoD um, suppliers have to comply with um, drug suppliers have to comply with the DFAR, new DFARS rule in this cybersecurity framework. Um, so the the main focus of today's talk is to um, today's panel is to answer your questions and um, give some clarity to the, the new DFARS regulations. <coughs> so Vicki, um, for the new DFARS rule, um, what steps does a small business need to do to be compliant with the DFARS rule? And how do, I, how do you know if you're compliant and how is compliance determined? So, thanks Ted. Um, I would say we should level set a little bit and talk about what the clause actually requires. Um, and first of all, it, is, it requires companies to um, secure covered defense information um, with, by um, implementing the requirements in the Special Pub 800-171, which is what Ted was referring to. The title of that publication is Protecting Controlled Unclassified Information in Non-Federal Information Systems and Organizations. So what NIST did is they actually wrote this publication with the non-federal systems in mind. If any of you are familiar with NIST Special Pub 800-53, about this thick, and it is applied to the government, and, and we have the ability as government to tailor out those requirements that we can't meet, or we don't want to meet, or however we, want to, we choose to, to deal with those requirements. And we have our own structure for certification and accreditation, and um, so it's fine for the government to use 53. But it isn't very useful when it comes to industry that already has networks in place, and they're already securing those networks. So. We were really excited when NIST decided to write this new publication because it has written in terms of performance-based standards. It's not so specific, like you will have 18 character passwords. It says you need to have multi-factor authentication. It doesn't tell you you must have a CAC or PIP. It just says figure out what's the right solution for you. So if you're talking about um, a small business where you want to start is by actually reading through the publication and understanding what the requirements are. There are 110 security requirements in the publication, and some of them are policy and process requirements, some of them are configuration hardware or software configuration, and some of them actually require a hardware and material purchase. So a lot of small businesses think they have to spend $100,000 to actually meet the requirements. That should not be the case. Um, I can't even imagine how a small business could spend that much money unless they were hiring out to someone else and trying to do it some other way. So, Really, the, the requirements are not as, as dire and as scary as they may think. So the first thing would be to read the requirements, figure out what you're already doing, and then figure out what you actually need to do. And in that process, one of the requirements is to develop a system security plan. So there's a lot of ways you can approach that. One of the, one of the easier ways may be to use um, and leverage DHS's tool called CISA. It's a, an evaluation tool that they can download from DHS answer the questions and it will help them, guide them to those, um, the system security plan and the plans of action that they're going to need to have in place. Thanks Vicki, um, I apologize, I forgot I was supposed to let each uh, panelist make an opening statement, so. Um, Mr. Miles, do you want to make an <coughs> opening statement? I don't know about an opening statement, but I'll launch right into kind of some discussion on that, that last point, right? So, we talked about the fact that there's 110 <coughs> security requirements in the in the NIST standard and that requires you to have a security plan. But I'd emphasize it's can you demonstrate that you actually are performing against the plan? Okay, so I have a, a recent example where a provider to both the Navy and the Marine Corps, actually a pretty critical provider, uh, their ATO lapsed with the Navy. Navy wouldn't give them a new ATO. So they came to the Marine Corps and said, hey, can you guys credit us? So, well, it's, it's going to take a look. So I sent one of our, our white teams our assessment visits out. And essentially, the product didn't really have a program, so to speak, and certainly didn't have a coherent way of giving objective quality evidence that they were working on. So we, we gave them some, a report, said, hey, this is some of the things you need to go look at. This is actually preceding the the default rule coming out. So we came back in about six months. They said, hey, we're ready to have you come back out. So we brought the assessment team back out. They had a plan on this document. They said, how about the objective evidence? Where are your reports on what you're doing? Didn't have any of that. 
So we didn't want you to just write a plan. We actually want you to do it. Right? So we went away for another six months and came back. They had actually fired their CIO, hired new people, gotten the program in place. They haven't included it. And by West Cross, the Navy has access to it again as well. So this isn't just about writing a plan. This is about risk management. This is about how do you execute a plan. So I agree. I don't know that it has to take $100,000. I don't know what it costs to go do it. But the point is there's a responsibility to protect the data. So however industry comes up with the mechanism, I'm not going to presume how they're going to do it. There's a multitude of ways. But it's about having a plan and then being able to show that you're executing the plan. Great. Erin, do you want to give your opening Yes, sure. So Vicki talked a little bit about the NIST 800-171, and Mr. Bobble talked about how it is put upon the <coughs> industry to implement that. Um, the way we do that in the Department of Defense is through acquisition regulations, and in our case, the DFARS. Um, so we have a DFARS clause that goes into every contract, with the exception of contracts for solely um, um, commercial off-the-shelf items, but every other contract should get the DFARS clause, safeguarding <coughs> covered defense information um, in it. And what that requires is a series of things, the first being that the contractor protect their internal information system when they are storing the um, department's what we call covered defense information, and you might think of it as DOD, CUI, or controlled unclassified information. Um, so the government has a responsibility when that clause is in a contract to let the contractor know what information is being provided to them that is covered defense information because that's how the, the contractor will know he needs to protect it. Um, now when the requirement is in place that he needs to protect his information system, if there were to be a cyber incident on that information system, the contractor is also required to report that cyber incident directly to DOD. And we do that because um, we're very concerned and interested in what information has been compromised. So more important than the fact that we want to know also how did the incident happen, most important, I think, for the department is what information. So we can then know if we need to put other things in place to mitigate any damage that may have taken place by that information being compromised. Um, the contractor is also required to flow that DFARS clause down with the information. So anywhere that covered defense information goes in the supply chain, he also needs to flow down that contract clause. And the prime contractor is now responsible for ensuring that that information is protected throughout his supply chain. So that's quite a challenge for our prime contractors. Um, and we understand that now they're looking at what are the best ways to do that. Um, so that's just a little bit, a part of the basics. Um, one thing I would mention is because this clause is currently in over 600,000 contracts, many of them involve very important information that we care very much about protecting. Other contracts may contain information that we don't want to invest so much money in to ensure the level of protection with the contractor. So while compliance means they have a system security plan in place, it may not always mean that the government's going to go in and assess their system. Um, so if the information was such that the government wanted to go in and assess the system, as Ms. Lombardo talked to, um, that would be added to the terms of the contract, and it would be very clear up front that that's the way that the government was going to ensure compliance. So there's actually a spectrum of ways that a requiring activity can choose to ensure that the, the contractor is complying with um, both the NIST requirements and the clause in general, and I think it will probably depend on the level of risk they're willing to accept with regard to the state of that contractor's information system. Yeah. So one thing to stress is that um, the way the language works in the clause, that you have to identify in the contract to the contractor the information that requires protection. If the requiring activity and the contracting officer working together don't do that, then the contractor is not necessarily responsible to do to protect that information. So it's really important that it is identified in some way in the contract. One of the most frequent ways you see it is for tech data in the schedules, if it's marked distribution B through F, that tells you that you've got some data that requires protection, but 
you need to make sure you're having that conversation with your, your contractors so that they know that they are accountable for that. Because if we don't do that, that burden is on the government to make sure that they know that. So I just want to make sure that you guys are thinking through that as you're developing your programs and writing your contracts. That also becomes very important when they then have to flow down that information. So for someone to just say all of this information is covered defense information, that's not helpful for the contractor when he's trying to determine if what he is flowing down also needs to be protected. Thanks, Mary. Teresa? I'd like to uh, mention a different, slightly different perspective and uh, kind of springboard off of something that Ken said about risk management, and that's what this is about. This is risk management in its purest form. From the Navy perspective, cybersecurity is absolutely critical to us and to our missions to, to support the, the warfighter and to support the na national security. Um, I've spent a lot of time, a lot of my career in private industry, and I have owned and run my own small business. And I wish at the time that I had had that business that there had been the guidelines available to me that have been put out by NIST right now because these guidelines are not there just to protect some data on your system as a small business. These are there to protect your system. These are the best practices that will allow you to have a thriving business and to protect your business and to protect your own interests as well as taking care of your customers. And I think that is absolutely critical when you think about it, this is not necessarily, you know, a requirement that's being put on your system to your detriment. This is something that is going to protect your business and allow it to grow. And I think it's critical to understand that the Navy wants and needs a thriving industrial base. And that's what we're working toward. And I think this clause really helps put that in place. If industry is thriving, then we're thriving. And it's important that we have the cybersecurity in place on both sides to protect each other. It would not be helpful for anyone if a system on either side of that fence, whether it's government or industry, were compromised and the downstream effects damage the relationships. So I think it's very critical to broaden the perspective as to what this really means. This is not necessarily just a bad requirement. This is actually extremely useful to businesses of all sizes. It's not onerous when it comes to the protections. They've been cut down a lot, and they are very, very much in line with best practices. Thank you. Can I just do a quick survey and see how many people here are from business versus government? How many people are business? Oh, good. I'm talking about people. How many are small business? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we do know that it does place a burden, especially on small businesses, and that's why we're here to try to educate you as much as possible so that you don't spend a lot of money on things that you don't need to and that you have a better understanding of what, what the DFARS clause and the cybersecurity framework is trying to do. Um, do we have a microphone at all for the questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, so next question is um, to Dr. Uh, Mr. Bible. Um, what is the Marine Corps doing to meet the challenges of IT modernization while building security and reliability into the system? I'll use it, something that I've been pressing on for uh, a couple of years now. I, I, I was really intrigued by our, uh, back in 2013 when I came uh, on board as the Chief Technology Advisor. We had this strategy around uh, our journey to cloud, but we wanted to start with a, a private cloud and then uh, learn how to run a cloud, how to go build apps for a cloud, how to uh, make that work. And then be able to be postured to go leverage the hybrid environment. What I've come to learn over time is that our, our big
biggest challenge is how do we start to integrate security into the, the systems from the point of initiation rather than bolting it on in the back end. And so this construct, it, it's really crystallized in just the last uh, year around the concept of dead set house. We've not mapped all of the controls at the infrastructure level and into the enclave and the servers and the OS. And I already have mapped them against my RMF posture. And then I give the software developer the toolkit and the, and the guides in terms of what ports and protocols. And I can build in the security testing against that source code as it's being checked in and out. What's left for an ETA? So this idea that uh, really uh, we call it CNA in a day. Uh, in essence, what's left? And I, I, I went to wrestling matches with Dr. Ray Lakeer, our, our uh, AO, over this construct. What's left? Right. And I really think now the Navy, uh, Admiral Danielle Barrett's picked up on this uh, theme, and they're going to beat us to it, I think, if, uh, if we don't watch out. But uh, her power to combat initiative has taken the same kind of uh, approach uh, to how do we rapidly build secure code from the outset. And so I think that's really at the heart of being able to build a more secure environment going forward is can we can we can we inherit the controls from everything except what I've got to modify in order to do the business process and then bake in the security uh, processes into the development process. So this construct of data sec ops is, is I think a true game changer for us, particularly as we take on more of what DOD wants to do with cloud and, and as we kind of push out and lighter weight uh, capabilities that we can rapidly turn cycles on to improve and Um, so Mary, um, from a small business perspective, um, when you're responding to an RFP, um, how does the company know whether their um, <coughs> cyber protection that they're proposing is adequate enough to meet the requirements um, for the RFP without knowing um, which what information is supposed to be protected? Um, is the government going to be explaining that in RFPs? So uh, um, one of the reasons why we have adopted the NIST 800-171 as the standard to provide the minimum baseline for what we call adequate security is because we realize that most contractors have a single enterprise network and they can't protect it differently depending on who their customer is. So by adopting a single standard and requiring that as in a clause, um, it allows us to consistently um, expect that that's the minimum baseline that our defense industrial base will have when they're doing business with us and storing our information. So you can know that the minimum protections required would be to implement the 110 requirements in the NIST 800-171. Um, if there are reasons on the department side why they feel other measures are required or again the way they want to ensure compliance might in involve more than just knowing that you have a system security plan in place that documents your implementation. They would write those terms into um, the solicitation so it would be clear um, at the outset of a procurement what you're expected to do um, in order to be responded to those um, requirements. Now, there might be cases where the contractor knows that to keep the information secure, they need to do more than NIST, NIST 800-171 on, on the contractor side as well. There might be certain things in place that would require they do additional things. Um, so the clause is written such that we provide what the minimum requirement is and the contractor may um, understand that there is more required, but largely because of the situation that they're in or what surrounds um, the details of their network that they're storing our information on. I would just note with regard to cloud too, um, we basically, from the department perspective, when looking at contractors, there's three different scenarios that would address how a cloud needs to be protected. So. If someone um, is a cloud service provider for the government and the government is contracting with them directly, um, then that cloud is really 
um, considered a government system, a DOD system. They're operating on behalf of the DOD, and the DOD cloud security requirements guide is what applies in terms of how that cloud is protected. If it's a cloud that the contractor is um, using as a part, as an extension of their internal information system, and they're bringing in a cloud service provider to do that for them, not on behalf of the government, but on behalf of the contractor, then that cloud must meet, um, it must be equivalent, meet the requirements equivalent to FedRAMP moderate. And then finally, if it's a cloud that the contractor built themselves internal to their system, um, then the requirements of NIST 800-171 would be sufficient. Um, but in each of those cases where the contractor is using a cloud as part of his internal information system or as an extension of it, they still need to meet the other requirements of the DFARS clause too. So even when storing information on a cloud, the contractor would still need the ability to report cyber incidents that occurred um, and to respond to the other requirements that they would find in the DFARS clause. Thank you. One, one more question for Dr. Lang and then we'll get to the audience question. Um, so Dr. Lang, um, we've spoken earlier about um, evaluation of um, what Navy logistics processes. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on that. Absolutely. In uh, 2014, the Navy started paying intense focus on cybersecurity ac across all of our domains. And one of the things that we were asked to do was an evaluation on the logistics systems, and that included the way that we interact with our vendors, and the vendors that supported us in that area also wanted uh, evaluations of the types of security that they should have. And we found that we needed to help them and we have done so, but the first thing that we did was make sure that we secured communication with them. Uh, it was very important for those vendors to protect their business information, uh, especially from a very, very hard competitive environment, and we changed our processes to accommodate that secure communication with them. We tightened up the cybersecurity on our portals to protect the transactions that we had with these vendors to make sure that their, their data was protected. And in turn, they made sure that they had gone through and instituted best practices in all of the areas that were in the 800 <coughs> They made sure that their system had identity management, that they had uh, strong passwords that they had, their firewalls checked, that they had basically all of the different controls that we had discussed. And one of the things that they found extremely helpful that was above and beyond the 171, but they found it important for their business processes, was encryption of data at rest and in transit. And we did a joint effort with them and found very low cost and trusted alternatives that would allow them to protect data, their business data, as well as our covered defense information on the systems. And at the end of the day, when we'd worked all of this out, it took a, about a year and a half to go through the entire process, the evaluations. They were extremely happy with the changes in their network and the changes in our network to heighten the security of their data coming to us. So I'll take a start at that. Um, we have opened a website. Um, it's called dodprocurementtoolbox.com. So it's open. Um, and everything that we have put out on the um, implementation of this clause to include several webinars, um, several tapings of different presentations, um, we have posted it there. So I would say that it is largely focused on the NIST 800-171 and the DFARS clause and not the broader risk management 
approach that, that you might be taking, but it does have a lot of tools there. Um, we also have